Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 18. A mighty passage. Uh, just the context, Paul is speaking about the Son of God here, whom we've had redemption through. Verse 15. He, the Son, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might have or be preeminent. That is the word of the Lord. Christianity, as we know it, is under great pressure. We saw it in the past week with the Essendon CEO fired for holding fast to Christ's word. Christianity is under pressure not just for that. Christianity has to wrestle and grapple with the question, is the Jesus who walked the earth 2,000 years ago, is that Jesus still relevant in the 21st century? I mean, that's what made it so absurd with the CEO, that he would hold to these teachings of a man so long ago when we are in the 21st century now? Is Jesus still relevant for the 21st century? I was just reading that in China, they have just successfully cloned an Arctic wolf. That's what we're doing in the 21st century. We are taking samples from Mars. We are planning expeditions to Mars. We have the metaverse now the digital world where you can live in and move a virtual reality. We are building mega cities and skyscrapers. And and it reminded me, as I was reading uh, this week, I was reminded of a story of a young boy who in Sunday school, just a little lad in Sunday school, said to his teacher at the end of the lesson, if Jesus came back today, would he know how to use an iPad? And it's funny, it's funny to, th- to think about that. But you need to think about how his brain is working here. Because he's hearing these stories of a man who wore long robes and sandals and he walked around in this far land and the people that he spoke to were Pharisees and he spent time with people called tax collectors and he visited synagogues and he had a following and he died. Is Jesus relevant? I mean, he seems so far removed from everything in this child's life. Jesus didn't drive a car. He didn't connect to Wi-Fi. He didn't have any of these things. Is he relevant? Paul here puts a portrait for us. He paints a portrait showing that the Jesus of 2,000 years ago He's more than just relevant for the 21st century. Nothing in this universe makes sense without him. Nothing. And here we get this glorious picture. Now, right through the scriptures, all of the scriptures are about Jesus. Old Testament and New Testament, it's all about him. Christ is hidden in every place. But before us this morning, the text that we have is the mountain peak is the highest view, the best view that we get of the person and glory of Jesus Christ. And so this is what we're going to consider. I feel tremendously, tremendously unworthy to talk about these words. What we have before us in the text, these are the diamonds of God. The diamonds of God. So can I invite you to pray with me? We ask the Lord to be gracious upon me and upon you because you will be accountable for the lofty and glorious words that you hear in this text. So please join with me with all your heart praying to the Lord. Our 
our Father, we come to you now and we approach an insurmountable height before us. Things too wonderful, things too glorious, things that angels desire to look into and cannot fathom. And yet here we are, seeking to understand them. But we do not do it because we're arrogant or because we're proud, but because it's in your word and you want us to know these things. And so, Lord, what you desire for us, may you grant to us. Give us understanding. May we see your son as he's painted and displayed so magnificently in these words. And we pray for the help of the Holy Spirit. If he does not come, all will fail to work in both the preacher and the hearer that every and each and every one may be turned to worship of your great son and we ask it in his name Amen Well here we have this glorious portrait of Christ that is put here but again with everything that is written in scripture has a context Paul doesn't just paint here for the sake of painting because he's got all the spare time what do we see? He's in prison So he's writing this for a reason. Now what's the context? False teachers had come in and they are presenting God, Christ and this universe in a distorted way. They are saying that only what is spiritual is good and anything that is matter, anything that is created, even creation itself, it's all evil. Anything physical is evil. And therefore, if this physical world in itself is evil, just by being physical, then God didn't create this world. But you have God at the top and then out of God are manifestations that came out of God, different emanations, different spiritual forces that came out of God. One of those spiritual forces was Jesus, the highest one. But then there were other spiritual forces, lower and lower and lower and lower and lower until you get one of them who made this earth. And so between heaven and earth, There are all these emanations and manifestations of God, different gods as they were. And Christ is far removed from that. God is far removed from that. And Paul cuts through this, all of this, and he paints a portrait of who Christ is. So we're at three points this morning. The first one, if you're taking notes, I hope you follow. The first one, we see Christ's majesty in the Godhead. Christ's majesty in the Godhead. Look at verse 15. He, the Son, is the image of the invisible God. We are told that God is invisible. And this is what Paul taught elsewhere in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He says, Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God. Now why is God invisible? Well, Jesus tells us in John chapter 4, verse 24, God is spirit. God is spirit. He doesn't have a physical body. He doesn't have any physical features. And because he is spirit, he is invisible. And and John says in the beginning of his gospel, chapter 1, verse 18, no one has ever seen God. That's what he says. And and Jesus, he also taught this when he was on earth. Jesus, in John chapter 6, verse 45, said, everyone who has heard from the Father and learned from him comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father. Now, if you've read your Bible, that should cause you to scratch your head. How can John say that? How can Jesus say that? Because we read our Old Testament and it seems to be full of examples of people who saw God. You have Moses. You have Isaiah in the temple. You have Daniel getting a vision of the Ancient of Days. So how can they say that no one has seen God? Well, when we see those examples in the Old Testament, they are theophanies, appearances of God. God manifesting His presence in a physical form because He is invisible and He wants to show us even a fragment of His glory. He manifests His presence in a physical way. That's why no two appearances are alike in the Old Testament. And because God is invisible and because He cannot be seen, God uses throughout the scriptures what we call anthropomorphic language. Now what that means is he uses to describe himself human physical features 
to help us understand him. So let me give you an example. In 2 Kings 19, Hezekiah spreads out his cry to the Lord and he says, Lord, incline your ear, hear, open your eyes and see. Listen to the words that Sennacherib has sent to mock the living God. God doesn't have eyes. God doesn't have ears. But this language is used of God so that we learn something about Him. He sees everything and He hears the prayers of His people and He is near to those who cry out to Him. God even uses in the Scriptures language, physical features of animals to describe Himself. For example, Psalm 91.4, He will cover you with His feathers and under His wings you will find refuge. God doesn't have feathers. God doesn't have wings. What's he trying to tell us? As a father, as a parent, I will care for you and protect you. You are safe in the shelter that I provide. So God uses all of this language to to reveal himself because why? He's invisible and he cannot be seen. You might be thinking, okay, Nathan, why what, what's the point of all this? Why are you saying all of this? What what what's the point? Well, again, verse 15. Christ is the image of the invisible God. Now, when we see that word there pop up in relation to God, when we see the word image, we should immediately cringe. We should be shocked. We should be appalled that Paul would use that word. Why? What does God continually warn against and forbid in the Old Testament? You shall make no images of God, nor shall you worship an image that is made either of something in heaven or on the earth. Why does God forbid it? Because He is invisible. Anything that is made of Him is idolatry. Because no one has ever seen God. And yet Paul here says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And as you hear that, you must think immediately, such words must be blasphemy. Unless the man Jesus is so much more than any other man. Unless the man Jesus is Emmanuel. God with us. Earlier I read only the first half of John chapter 1 verse 18. Let me read the first and the second half. John says, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. The Son. See, it's not a glorious creature that is the image of God. No, Philippians 2 6. Christ, Jesus Christ, who was in the very form God, did not account quality with God something to cling to. He is the Son of God. A few weeks ago, you may remember you who were here, we looked at Psalm 19. And what did we see there? The heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the works of His hands. God has revealed Himself through creation. We see His divine nature, that He's powerful, that He's wise, and that He's good in how He's made this world. We see all of those things. But what did we find out? Man sees something of God, but he builds idols because he doesn't understand who God is. So what does God do? He cuts through the confusion and He gives us His Word. He gives the Scriptures, the spoken and written Word of God. And there in the Scriptures, we see what He is like, His attributes, His perfections. We see His will and His plan for this world. And then finally, at the perfect timing, God fully peels back the curtain. And we read Hebrews 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our forefathers by the prophets. We have the scriptures. But in these last days, He's spoken to us by His Son. The Son is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. Now God has revealed Himself. See, before God spoke and He put words on the paper for us to know Him. And now the Word who was God and who was with God, that Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God took on human nature. God came down 
to us. See, the infinite, the almighty, the invisible God, He came so near to us. Not only could we now hear Him, but we could see Him. Not only could we see Him, but we could touch Him. And not only could we touch the hem of His garments, but we could converse with God face to face. And it was just like the days of Eden when man walked with God. And God was walking this earth. Walking this earth. Jesus comes revealing the invisible God and He dispels all the fog. He drives out all ambiguity, all uncertainty. There's no room for speculation because God is here in the flesh. And He is seen. Do you remember Philip when he comes up to Jesus not long before Jesus is about to die and Jesus says, uh, Philip says to Jesus, Jesus, show us the Father and it'll be enough. Jesus looks at him and says, have I been with you so long and you still don't know me, Philip? How can you say, show us the Father? He who has seen me has seen the Father. That's what he says. He is the image of the invisible God. Understand, when it comes to God, not all roads lead to Rome. There can be no knowing God outside of Jesus. There can be no relationship with God apart from Jesus. There can be no pleasing God apart from Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. And so here, first up, Paul, in this portrait, we see Christ's majesty in the Godhead. Secondly, this morning, we see Christ's majesty in creation. Christ's majesty majesty in creation. Now, Paul moves from Christ's position in the Godhead to his position in creation. And this is where Paul spends most of his time here. Look at verse 15, the second half. He's the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. The firstborn of all creation. Now, if there has ever been one verse in the Bible that has been so misunderstood, if there's ever been one verse in the Bible that has been twisted to cause so much damage, it's this line here. It's this line that he is the firstborn. It's been used to promote great heresies. The firstborn of all creation. Now you can see it's not hard to fall into error here when you look at it at first glance. It seems to read, if Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, then that must mean that he is the first thing that God created. In the fourth century, there was a church leader, church history. His name was Arius. And he promoted this view of Jesus, that Jesus was God's first created being. And all the church leaders gathered together and they drove him out of the church. He was kicked out of the church for the heresy. And just like Satan, when he rebelled against God, he took all the angels with him. And so Arius took a bunch of followers with him, preaching that Christ was a created being. Now, we have a modern cult today who has taken on the teaching of Arius and promoted it. And we know them well, the Jehovah's Witnesses. They deny the Trinity and they preach that Jesus is a created being. And they have many followers today and they both appeal to this verse here. The firstborn of all creation. Now, are they right? How are we to understand this? It cannot mean that Jesus is a created being because in the same breath, Paul has just said that he is God in the flesh. He's the image of the invisible God. It's impossible. It's a wrong interpretation. But how do we understand it? Do we need to kind of fix up what Paul's written here? He's kind of clumsy with his words. Let's try and come up with an interpretation that fits what we understand about God. No, we don't need to do that. We just need to read the scriptures. The Bible will tell us what it means. The firstborn is used in the Old Testament repeatedly. Repeatedly. It refers to status. Someone's position and a high position. Think about it. In the Jewish household, who was the one that received the blessing? The firstborn. Who was the one that received the majority of the inheritance? The firstborn. Who was the one that got all the benefits of the family name? The firstborn. 
And in the Jewish monarchy, who was the one that succeeded the king's throne? Firstborn. See, when we read the Old Testament, is here a refers to status in Psalm 89. It's a prof, it's a psalm about the future Messiah. It talks about David, but then it points forward to the greater David and the Messiah. Look how it uses the term firstborn. Psalm 89, 27. God says, I will make him the firstborn, the highest of all the kings of the earth. Do you see what it means there? It means supreme. It means first. So for David, it meant that he would be the greatest king in all of the land. He would have the greatest kingdom. What does it mean of the Messiah, of the Son? It's another way of saying he is the King of kings. And he is the Lord of lords. He is sovereign over this creation. And it is another example that one day every knee will bow before him and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is absolutely supreme. He is a sovereign ruler. Now, what does this mean for us? It means that Christ is due our utmost loyalty, our utmost submission, total undivided hearts, utmost reverence, so great a Lord is He. Every knee will bow one day. Do not be one of those who does it under compulsion, under His wrath on the final day. Why? When He reaches out His scepter even now. So why is Jesus the firstborn over all creation, the sovereign? Why is that? Well, Paul gives a few reasons why now. Look at verse 16. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Now, this is an incredible claim. It's it's almost incomprehensible when you look at this. The Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter's son, He is the one that created the entire universe. Now, is Paul a madman to say this about that Jesus? No, 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 no. The Apostle John, he also understood this and said it. John chapter 1, verse 3. Through him, everything was made. Not one thing in all creation was made without him. Not one thing. Now, why does Paul... Paul says that Jesus created all things but he feels the need to say things in heaven and on earth. Why why does he feel the need to do that? He said all things. He's pointing us back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, people ask the question, where is Jesus in the Old Testament? Where is he? I don't see him. He's in the very first line. You just need the New Testament glasses to see him there. He is the one who created the heavens and the earth. And see, that settles the lie of Arius. And it settles the lie of the Jehovah's Witnesses. He's not a creature. He was not created. He is the creator. He is the creator and he's nothing less. And it settles the lie of the false teachers who came to Colossae, saying that Jesus and God, they're so far removed from this creation because creation is evil. Now, Paul says, He is the creator of it. And he made it good. So Paul goes on to say that he created things, all things in heaven and on earth. And then he says things visible and things invisible. And look at these invisible things. What are these invisible things that he created? Verse 16, the second half there. Things visible and invisible. And he gives us what the invisible is, whether thrones or dominions or rulers, or authorities. Now, here, when you get those thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities, that's Jewish language there. That's how they spoke of angelic beings. The Jews, and especially these false teachers coming in, they used to think that there was rankings of the angelic beings. They had different authority levels. So that's why you get thrones, dominions, rulers, different classes. Now, when we get this here, Paul is talking about good angels, and he's talking about bad angels. The good angels who, God, who are God's ministers, they come, God sends them to protect us in our daily lives. You don't see them, but they're always at work. They're faithful ministers. But he's also referring to bad angels, fallen angels, including Satan himself. Now, 
the false teachers, Paul is cutting into that. We're going to see in a few weeks what they were actually teaching. Let me give you the heads up. In chapter 2, verse 18, Paul writes to the church, and he says, Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and the worship of angels. They were leading the church to start worshipping these spiritual beings of high ranking. And, And how does Paul cut through that? Jesus created them. He's the creator over all the spiritual beings. Now, he didn't create them evil. He created them like he created Adam and Eve. Good. But like Adam and Eve, some of them chose to rebel and come out from joyful submission to him. And they rebelled. So Paul's point here is that Christ has authority over all the physical creation and all the spiritual creation. All of it. He is sovereign and ruler over. And as I was thinking about this, um, and I was sharing it with Brooke earlier on in this year, um, my belief of this was, was tested. And earlier on in the year, a friend from the church that I was at, he said, Nathan, I'm working with a guy, he's a fellow worker with me, and he is going through a terrible time. He's experienced great demonic pressure in his house at the moment. He said, there are evil spirits in his house. They're tormenting his wife. They're tormenting the children. There's manifestations. It's, it, it's I mean, I'm not going to list the things. It was horrific. It was horrible. He said, Nathan, will you come with me? We'll go to his house. We'll talk to them. And so we went and we met the family. We met the children. And we spoke to them and trying to work out, you know, are they of faith? And they said, oh, they had a Catholic background. They called the priest to come. He went to the front door. He left straight away. And we started talking with them. They didn't have any faith. And as they were talking and saying all of these things, and then they said, well, you're a pastor, right? So, you know, we've tried burning incense. We've read stuff online. You're a pastor. I said to them, you coming to my church is not going to fix anything here. But look at all these, these things are happening. They're tormenting our kids. They're seeing things in the house. So what will me and my friend to do? What were we to do in that moment? There's only one thing to do in that moment. Give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is only one in the scriptures who had power and authority over the demons. There is only one whom the demons trembled before, and it was Christ. And saying to them, listen, we can't say a magic prayer for you. Demons may be coming against you, but if you are not in a right relationship with Christ, He is not for you at the moment. You need to be reconciled to God. You need Christ to forgive you of your sins. We are here because we're not afraid, because we're covered by Christ. But you need Christ. And they sent us out. Christ alone has authority over the physical creation and over all things spiritual. Not only did he create them, but Paul says, Why Jesus created them? Why did he create all of these things? Why did he create this universe? Look at the last line of verse 16. All things were created through him and for him. For him. See, Paul unveiled creation's beginning. Jesus created everything. Now Paul tells us where creation is heading. What's the goal of creation? For Jesus Christ. See, at the beginning, Christ gave the word, and at his command, all things came into being. What do we read at the end of the Bible? When Christ comes back, he's going to give the command, and all of creation is going to be summoned to him. All of creation is going to be brought before him. And as we said, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And so for us, as we look at these things about Christ, we have to think if the tiniest insects were made for him. If the galaxies far away that we can never see were made for him. If babies, children and adults were made for him. And if all the angelic beings were made for him, how then ought we to live? How ought we to live? If everything is for him. And the answer to that question, Paul writes the exact same words at the end of Romans chapter 11. He says, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Same words. What does Paul write in the very next line? Therefore, brothers and sisters, I urge you by the mercies of God, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. 
holy and pleasing to Him, which is your spiritual worship. How ought we to live before someone so great and glorious, offering our lives as living sacrifices, all in for Jesus, not one foot in and one foot out, not half in, completely and totally for Him. We were made for Him, to know Him, to love Him and adore Him, to worship Him and to have Him as Lord over our lives. It's all in. It's all in. For Him, all things were made. We have a quote at home that has been special in our family. C.T. Studd wrote, quote, Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. See, our relationships, our marriages, our children, how we live, our ambitions, our goals, everything you put your hand to, Everything in life, the use of our time and our gifts, everything is to be done to the glory of Christ. And if it's not, we find out that it will be burned up on the last day. Everything is for Him. And now Paul shows one other facet of Christ's majesty in creation. He made it all. He's the goal of all of creation. In verse 17, verse 17, And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. In Christ all things hold together. Paul's saying He not only just made this universe and creation, He is the one sustaining it. So He creates all the stars in the sky thousands of years ago, but He's the one that's still causing them to burn bright. He created planet Earth, and He's the one that keeps it spinning on its course. He created you and I and knit us together in our mother's womb. But He's the reason why you can still feel your pulse this morning. He is sustaining you. If, Paul's saying, if Christ for one moment was to stop His ministry over creation, everything would come apart. This world would be destroyed instantly. Everything would come apart. And this is an extraordinary claim. Do you see what Paul's doing here to this church? He's saying that baby that was born in Bethlehem, the carpenter's son, the one who drew water from wells and washed his followers' feet, he is the one that made this earth and he's sustaining it. Is Jesus still relevant today? Now, why is he writing this? Listen, if you look at all this and see what Paul is painting here, he's written it more than just to impress you to intellectually impress you, we should marvel at the grace of Jesus Christ. He made this creation and He came into this creation and this world rejected Him. The world that He came to save crucified Him. And even when He rose from the dead and triumphed and is seated at the right hand of God, this world still rejects Him. He is mocked and ridiculed in this world. He's a skit for comedians and his name is blasphemed in nearly every movie. He's rejected and despised even today. And I ask you, has he ceased to be gracious to this world? Is the earth still spinning? Are the stars still shining bright? Can you still feel your pulse? Has he withheld any kindness from this ungrateful world? Not one bit. And yet, He continues to feed the world that bites His hand. His fiercest enemies are absolutely dependent upon Him. And still He gives. What did we sing earlier? It was so fitting. How great, how sure. His love endures forevermore. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. Oh, how He loves you this morning. He loves you. He loves you. Have you received Him? And have you come to love Him because He first loved you? Or friend, are you still one who is biting the hand that so graciously feeds you? He's a great, great Savior. So we've seen Christ's majesty in the Godhead, Christ's majesty in creation, and lastly and very briefly, Christ's majesty in the church. Next, we're coming to that. Look at verse 18. 
and he is the head of the body, the church. Now, no doubt you're familiar with this metaphor, the head and the body. The church is likened to many things in the scriptures. We're likened to a field. We're likened to a flock. We're likened to a temple, a spiritual building. Here we are likened to a body. And Paul says this in other passages. We are a single entity made up of many members. Now, when Paul talks about this in other passages in the New Testament, the emphasis is on us being members and how much we need each other because we've got different gifts. When Paul talks about the bo- us being a body here, the emphasis isn't on us. The emphasis is on the head. It's on the head. It's on Christ. Now, what does it mean that Jesus is the head of the body? What's the metaphor? Well, he's the head. We are the body. Now, arms, they have a purpose. They can accomplish many things. So it can feet and toes and knees. They all have a purpose. But it is the head that controls the body. It is the head that governs each of the members. It is the head that has authority over the members. You see, this is a great reminder that the pastor is not the head of the church. The elders and deacons are not the head of the church. Yes, God has given leaders to the church, but they are mere men. The head of the church is the God-man, Christ Jesus. He's head and he holds authority, all authority over the church. He said when he left, before he went to heaven, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It's his. It is his church and it belongs to him and he loves us very much. But the metaphor of the head over the body, it means more than just that he has authority over us. The metaphor shows that the head also nourishes and gives sustenance to the members. It's what gives life. Christ, as the head of the church, he continually nourishes us and gives us spiritual life. You know, Jesus gave another metaphor for this, of his role in our lives. He said, I'm the vine and you're the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. He gives spiritual life to the church. He nourishes us and sustains us. And Christ, do you see what Paul is painting here of Christ? It's marvelous. He's bringing everything together. He says, not only did he create the universe, he sustains it. Not only did he create the church, but he sustains her. He's nourishing her. He is everything. It's all about him. He's building his church. And he's not just the head. Look at verse 18, the second line there. He's the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning. The church has its origin in Christ. Just as Eve was taken out of Adam, so the church came from Christ and has its life from him. He is the source of our life and existence. The church. Well, what else makes him the head of the church? And this is where Paul wraps up. Verse 18, that third line there. He is the firstborn from the dead. The firstborn from the dead. This is referring to his resurrection from the dead. Now, we come back to that word again, right? Firstborn. He is the firstborn from the dead. What does it mean? Christ was not the first one ever to be raised. Elijah raised the widow's son. Elisha raised a boy. Jesus raised a little girl from the dead. And he raised a grown man from the dead, Lazarus. So what does it mean that he's the firstborn from the dead? Well, what did all those people who were resurrected, what did they share in common? They all died twice. Twice. They were raised and then they lived a life and then they died and they were buried again. Christ, when he rises from the dead, he defeats death, he slays death. And he triumphs over it in victory. And so too, the church who receives its life from him, we too will rise from the dead because he's the firstborn. What is Paul saying, Corinthians? That Christ has risen indeed from the dead, the first of a great harvest of all who have died. And Jesus said to his disciples, because I live, you also will live. We will share in it. And so friends, we need not fear death. We need not go worrying about everything and the latest things that are falling our world. And we need not worry about where we're going to be buried. Because we will rise. And now, Paul, after painting this portrait, what frame does he put it in? 
What frame should such a portrait go in? Well, there's only one way. Look what he says. He is the first, firstborn from the dead, that in everything he may be preeminent. Why does he paint this portrait for us? So that Jesus Christ would be seen as first of all. Supreme. The glorious one. First and last. And everything in between. It's all about Christ. So that Jesus might have preeminence in everything. Is Jesus still relevant in the 21st century? He's not just some distant Bible character in that features in our stories. What do we sing in the very last song? It's about your son. It's more than just stories on pages. It's about your son who's come to live here with us. He is relevant. And so let me close. Let me close. The reality is that Christ is supreme over all things. And so the question becomes, has this reality affected your life? Who he is. And there's two groups among us this morning. The first group, let me ask you, do you live for yourself? Do you live for what pleases you and what you want in this world? If that's you, you are an idolater. You were not made for yourself. You were made for him. And he loves you. And the maker came down to earth to die in your place, to suffer for your sins so that you may have peace and life and be reconciled to God. And so I plead with you this morning, if that's you, repent of your sin and come at his feet and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And whoever comes to him, he will never cast out. Ever. Never. There is another group this morning. For the Christians in the room. Is the reality of who Christ is Is it affecting the way that you live? Is it affecting how you're using your time? That remind you of that quote, C.T. Studd, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Are you living for Him? Let's not live one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world. Let's go all in for Christ. Let's live completely to Christ. And let me urge you with the Apostle Paul, by the mercies of God, I plead with you, offer your bodies as living sacrifices to one who is so great. Let us live for him in every part of our life so that he may be preeminent in all things. Let me pray. Father, we worship you. And we come, and as we honor you, we want to honor the Son, your Son, the Lord Jesus. We thank you for these words. They are too great for us, and we have scratched the surface. But we pray, Lord, that we have seen enough for now, and we pray that it would begin a search in our lives to know you more, to know the Lord Jesus Christ more. I pray that we would live completely and totally for him. We were made for him. And I pray for any again, who are far from you, who have rejected you, that they may come and believe on your Son, may come to their senses even today and embrace the Lord of heaven and earth. May you be pleased to bless each precious soul in this room this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.